Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Happy New Year. Welcome to The Vine, the online uh, video worship service for the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors, and it's my joy to welcome you to this worship service today. And we're so glad that you're joining us from wherever you may be. Uh, there will be a, a QR code uh, that will pop up on the screen, and if you would uh, scan that into your phone or take a picture of it, it will give you a link through which you can register uh, that you are in attendance, that you are watching this video, and we would appreciate hearing from you. In the Christian year, this is the second Sunday after Christmas, and we also observe this Sunday as Epiphany Sunday with uh, the day of Epiphany coming uh, during this coming week when we celebrate the arrival of the Magi or the wise men to bring gifts to the baby Jesus. Thank you for joining us for this worship service today. We pray that this service will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us unite our hearts as we go before God in prayer. Almighty God, as your Son, our Savior, was born of a Hebrew mother, but rejoiced in the faith of a Syrian woman and of a Roman soldier. And as he welcomed Greeks who sought him and allowed a man from Africa to carry his cross, so teach us to regard people from all races and ethnic backgrounds as people you love and for whom Christ died. May we welcome all believers as fellow heirs of the kingdom of Jesus Christ our Lord. And may our worship today be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Kings of Orient are bearing gifts with travelers afar. Field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright. Westward leading, still proceeding. One of the things that we regularly do in our worship services, both in person and online, is that we affirm together 
the faith that we hold in common. I invite you now to join with me in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The scripture for today is Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied, who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Good job. St. Louis and it's time for our morning prayer and so I invite you to pray with me. Most holy and gracious God, Lord as we start a new year we have to thank you for sustaining us through the year that we just ended. Lord there were so many trials and tribulations, so many ups and downs. We struggled with COVID, we struggled with family issues, financial issues, even our church um, had its struggles as well. And Lord, we just want to say thank you because you were there through it all and you have led us into through this year um, to greater glories than we could ever imagine. Father God, I, I thank you for the ways that you continue to show us 
the light and show us the path that you would have us go. Father, I pray that we might continue to walk the path of righteousness that you've laid out for us. Lord, as we move into this new year, I'm sure that once again, there will be more ups and downs. There will be struggles. But Lord, we know from the past that we can lean on you. We know that we can always lean on your promises. We know that we can always lean on your everlasting arms. So Father, I pray right now that as we have struggles in our own lives and in our own families with our own loved ones, Lord, that we might take a moment and stop and lift up those that are on our hearts right now. And now God, I ask that we might follow your son, Jesus Christ, into this new year, that we might go wherever he leads us. And Lord, that we would be true disciples that walk in the way that leads to eternal life. Lord, may we be people who are simply an extension of the body of Christ, that we become your hands and feet in this world. Give us the opportunity, give us the courage, and give us the faith. We ask this in the strong name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So in this video, I'm coming to you from Bush Stadium where the St. Louis Cardinals uh, play baseball. And um, we've had a great time out here in St. Louis, and, but uh, always, as always, look forward to getting back home. And I'll be back um, on Sunday. Actually, I'll be back um, in time for the first of the year. But uh, this video, of course, takes a little time to uh, get recorded and edited. Um, anyway, I just want to say thank you um, on behalf of the, the entire church um, for the ways that you were generous in 2021. Um, our church leaders mentioned a couple of months ago that we were uh, struggling financially as a church, and you have come through. And, um, and we're going to do... Um, going to finish this year very well. I, I can't, I haven't seen the, the final numbers, but I, I know that, um, that things have, have really picked up in, in this month. And I just want to say thank you um, to everybody um, who has contributed over this year and look forward to a, another amazing year at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Um, as we start the new year, you can always give to the ministries of the church um, by putting a check in the mail and sending it to Post Office Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. Or you can um, give through our app or through our website, which is wrightsvilleumc.org. Thanks again for your generosity that continues to fund the ministries of Wrightsville United Methodist Church.
Hey boys and girls, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri today and it is cold. I'm a thousand miles away from Wrightsville Beach. I visited my sister and her family who live near St. Louis. Here's my sister, say hey to her. Hi. That's Jennifer, that's my sister. Thanks, Jen. And so, like I said, we're in St. Louis and St. Louis is famous for an interesting national monument called the Gateway Arch. Can you see it behind me? The arch, to me, always looks like something that we see in nature if it only had some color to it, like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or violet. Do you know what I'm thinking about? Does it look like something that happens in nature to you? What is it? Does it look like a rainbow? I think it looks a little bit like a rainbow if it just had the colors. Anyway, whenever I see this arch, it reminds me of rainbows. And rainbows remind me of God. Because God promised us way back in the beginning, in, way back in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 9, that whenever we see a rainbow, we know that that is God's promise to us that he's going to take care of all the earth. So whenever you see a rainbow, think about that. And I think that's a great thing for us to be thinking about as we go into this new year of 2022, is to remember that God has promised that he'll always take care of us, that he'll always take care of all of his creation. So we don't have to live in fear and we don't have to be scared. Instead, we can we can eagerly look forward to the new year and all that God has in store. And for me, I find that exciting. So from St. Louis, I just want to say hello, and I'll see y'all next week when I get back home. And I, whenever you see a rainbow or perhaps even an arch, think about how God promises to take care of us. All right, let's pray. Almighty God, thank you that you always take care of us. Thank you for your promises, which you never break. Help us to be excited about this new year. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville, and today I'll be bringing you our message from my parents' home in Columbus, Ohio. Our passage of scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had sent the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who was called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had among us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm so excited that this week we are starting off a new sermon series for the new year. Today begins our series called, Can I Ask That? This series came out of conversations we had as a staff about the questions people have who aren't super plugged into church about Christianity. These are the kind of questions that Doug and David and I get asked in the community as pastors all the time. They're the questions that we get asked by our Uber drivers or our fellow passengers on airplanes, even our hairdressers and nail technicians. But there are also questions that many of us inside the church have as well, but we might not feel so comfortable asking them. I was so excited when Doug asked me to tackle our first question, does God love everyone? When I first sat down to prepare this message, the answer seemed completely obvious. Of course God loves everyone. The Bible is filled with declarations of God's love. Just look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Or one of my favorite verses, Romans 38 through 8, 38 through 39, that says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But then I started thinking about some other passages in the Bible. What about the book of Joshua, where God seems to sanction the killing of every single person living in the city of Jericho? What about Malachi 1, chapter, verse 2, where God says, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Many of us grew up singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But sometimes what we read in the Bible doesn't seem to match so easily with our understanding of a loving God. I can only imagine how complicated the question, does God love everyone, probably seems to people who know only about Christianity what they see and hear from Christians. Unfortunately, our witness to God's love has not always been clear. Since its conception almost 2,000 years ago, the church has spent a lot of time trying to figure out who was in and who was out. We've been trying to draw boundary lines around what's acceptable to God and what is not. And unfortunately, that has often turned into who is acceptable to God and who is not. Our concern with who is acceptable to God usually comes from a good place. We love God and we want to live in ways that are pleasing to God. We love people and we want to be sure that they are right with God. But all of the ugliest moments in church history have come when we have gotten a little bit too certain about who was in and more importantly, who was out. We can take comfort that this is not a new problem. In fact, the concern with who is in and who is out in the church goes at least all the way back to the Old Testament. For devout Jews, there was no question where the dividing line of God's love rested. Scripture was clear that God's care was reserved for the people of Israel. Sometimes other nations would be given victory or success, but it was really only just a temporary way and for the purpose of making a point to God's chosen people, Israel. The Jews understood the world as being divided into two groups. There were the Jews 
and there were the Gentiles. Gentiles meaning the nations or absolutely anyone who wasn't Jewish. That might sound sort of mean and exclusive to us, but to the Jewish people, it was absolutely beautiful. Of all the big, powerful empires in the world, the God of the universe had chosen this one scrappy little nation and said, I will be your God and you will be my people. Plus, God had told them that all the nations of the world would be blessed through them. It wasn't necessarily that God didn't care about the other nations, but God was only in covenant relationship with Israel. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the disciples, who were all Jewish, assumed that this movement of Jesus followers would remain only for Jews. Jesus was Jewish, and he was the promised Jewish Messiah. But all of that began to change a bit after Pentecost. The disciples and the leaders of this new Jesus movement were all staying at someone's house in a place called Joppa. Peter was waiting for his dinner to be ready, and he was sitting on the roof of the house. While he was there, he saw a vision from God of something that looked like a big sheet being lowered down from the heavens, filled with animals and reptiles and birds. And God said, Peter, kill and eat. Well, that didn't make any sense at all to Peter because the animals in this vision weren't ritually clean. Observant Jews were forbidden from eating these animals according to the law of their Bible, the Torah. Peter rightly responds, surely not, Lord. After all, maybe this was some sort of test of Peter's faithfulness, that he wouldn't agree to break God's commands, even though he was really hungry. But God sends the same vision again, and then a third time, each time pointing to these unclean animals and telling Peter to eat them. And finally, God says to Peter, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Peter is knocked out of his trance by the voice of someone downstairs calling up that Peter has some visitors. God's voice then comes to Peter again and says, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. Just outside Peter's door is a group of Gentile men, and not just any Gentiles, Roman military officials. Remembering God's words, Peter goes with the men and stays at the house of their master, a centurion named Cornelius. Already, Peter is breaking the rules of Jewish life. Jews weren't supposed to associate with Gentiles like, Gentiles like this, and they cer certainly were not meant to stay in their houses. So why was it that Peter was so willing to break with his religious tradition? What changes Peter's mind isn't some sort of sophisticated argument. It isn't data or a neat presentation. It's the movement of the Holy Spirit. First, Peter receives a vision from God. It has to happen three times because this is such a surprising and countercultural message. Peter even fights God on this. Surely not, God! Isn't it interesting how we can use our preconceived notions of God to try to silence God's actual voice? When we're more co committed to defending our idea of God than in listening to God, we miss out on what it is that God's actually doing. The vision God gives Peter then leads him to take the next step. He's called to go into the house of a Gentile. This is a great sort of intermediate step for Peter. To do this, he doesn't have to believe that Gentiles are included in God's redemptive work. He doesn't need to be ready to write a new position statement he just needs to go where God tells him to go. When Peter arrives, he meets Cornelius, and he can see that even though he isn't a Jew, he is seeking God and trying to do what is right. When Peter shares the gospel with Cornelius and his family, 
the Holy Spirit falls on them all. As Peter describes it later, he says, So if God gave them the same gift he gave to us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Peter lets himself be surprised by God, caught off guard by just how expansive God's love is. God's love is for the Gentiles, too. Later on in the New Testament, we see the early church trying to figure out what to do with all of these newly converted Gentiles. At first, it seemed that what needed to be done was to make the Gentiles Jewish first and then Christian. In other words, they needed to be circumcised. They needed to follow all of the dietary laws contained in the Torah. We might balk at these requirements now, but for Jews in the first century, these laws were not just hoops to jump through. They were held dear as morally right. The witness of scripture seemed to be clear to them that strict adherence to the words of Torah was the way to please God, to be holy, to live rightly. They didn't think of themselves as trying to be exclusive or as being bigoted against Gentiles. They just wanted to do what God said was right. It turns out that what God was up to was way bigger than what the Jewish disciples ever even imagined. God didn't need the Gentiles to become Judah, Jewish in order to please God. While calling them ever into deeper discipleship in the ways of Jesus, God didn't need them to be Jewish. God loved them just as they were. I have to admit that the fact that God loves people just as they are is often very difficult for me to accept. Anytime that I'm writing a sermon, I start to see the themes I'm writing about pop up all around me. It's almost like God is preaching a sermon to me first before I preach. This message was no exception. A week or two ago, I was chatting with a fellow pastor about a politician I fiercely disagree with receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion. I made some snarky comment about how, of course, this politician should take communion since we as Methodists believe it's a converting sacrament. In other words, God could use communion to knock some sense into this politician. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, God knocked some sense into me. Even if my political opinions were perfectly aligned with the will of God, and I certainly hope I don't have so much pride as to assume that they are, agreement with my political opinions is not a prerequisite for God's love. I had been imagining this politician as someone God loves only as much as they have the ability to change and become more like me to align with what I think is right to believe and to do. But our job is not to police what other people need to do in order to be righteous. We don't get to give God a list of everything that needs to change in someone else. We are not the gatekeepers of the church. Jesus is. What if we trusted God enough to believe that God will convict people of the things they need to be convicted of. As Christians, our job is not to teach people how to live. Our job is to point people to Jesus so that Jesus can teach them how to live. Here's the real kicker. If a wider group of people can be accepted by God than we originally thought, and if they can be accepted as they are, that means there's mercy for you too. I recently saw a post on Facebook which claimed Christians believe in a God who loves you unconditionally under certain circumstances. The post was a critique of Christianity from someone outside the faith, and obviously it isn't exactly nuanced. But when I read it, I laughed out loud. 
because I realized that the way I often live my life would suggest I believe God loves me only under certain circumstances. Like, I qualify for God's grace so long as I don't oversleep and miss my morning devotional time. Or I qualify for God's grace so long as I have the right beliefs about God and the world. Or so long as I work hard enough for justice. But God doesn't just love us for the potential we show. The gospel isn't God's love endures forever so long as you straighten up and fly right. The gospel is Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. If God's love is expansive enough that it covers even the people I can't imagine God loving, it's big enough to cover me too. In the life of the church, today is the Sunday when we celebrate Epiphany. Epiphany marks the coming of the three wise men from the East to the baby Jesus. In church tradition, we understand this day as commemorating the revelation of Jesus to the Gentiles. This is the day when, like Peter, we are surprised again by how much more expansive God's love and acceptance is than we ever imagined. That's what God's love is, a surprise, an epiphany. An epiphany is a revelation we never would have guessed but that suddenly makes everything make perfect sense. The Jews thought that scripture was clear about who was in and who was out, but God gave Peter an epiphany. Jesus is the solution to problems we didn't know that we had, the answer to questions that we weren't even asking. But when we see that baby in a manger, we go, Oh, it all makes sense now. Jesus is the epiphany that reveals God's love. Love that is beyond our wildest imaginings. Love that is for more people than we can wrap our heads around. Love that is for everyone and everyone as they are. Love that's even for me and for you. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you for the epiphany of your love. We thank you that your love is bigger than we've ever dared to dream and that it's big enough even for us. Lord, would you help us to be willing to be wrong, willing to be surprised by who you are including in your new kingdom. Make us more loving and accepting in the world just as you have loved and accepted us. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
now in the confidence that God's love is more expansive than you have ever even imagined. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own, go above you to watch over you and protect you, go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand, go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.